The Hotelling rule is a very th elegant theoretical result and has driven for a long time most neoclassical economic thought about exhaustible resources. Starting in the 1970s, economists started to try to find empirical evidence of the hotelling rule, looking at real-world data on the prices of exhaustible resources. And I think it's fair to say that it has been impossible to find real-world examples where the hotelling rule holds. The empirical evidence for the hotelling rule is essentially totally lacking. In the real world, re renew, uh, exhaustible resource firms simply don't seem to be following the hoteling rule. So that raises the question, why not? What is going on? And there are two completely different answers. One answer is the answer that's given by most neoclassical economists, which is firms seem like they're not obeying the hoteling rule but they actually are in the following way. So again, profit versus Q, this the same graph I drawn on the upper left. What they say is that suppose the stock of exhaustible resources is gigantic. If it were infinite, you'd be here at the short run profit maximizing point. It's not infinite, but it's really, really big. If it's really, really big, then what the selling rule says is marginal profit rises at the rate of interest, but it starts out at a teeny tiny number. So that in time period one, you might be here, in time period two, you might be here, in time period three, you might be here. And, and actually, I can't really draw it in this graph, but those lines should, uh, could in theory be much, much closer together than I've drawn. And so, and maybe these are decades, over so the first decade, second decade, third decade. So for the first few decades, or even for the first few centuries, you really don't see the hoteling rule. You can't detect it empirically. It's still happening. Firms are still following it. But marginal profit starts out at such a tiny level that the changes that result from marginal profit rising at the rate of interest are really, really small changes. Um, imagine trying to distinguish this quantity from this quantity from this quantity. It's, it's really hard to do, especially if those lines are even smaller than I drew. Or this level of profit from this level of profit from this level of profit. Again, assuming that the lines are even closer than what I've drawn, you just can't empirically distinguish those things when so many other things in the real world cause numbers to jump around. So if you buy that explanation, firms don't appear to be following the hoteling rule, but they actually are. What you have is the hoteling rule going on in a situation where resource stocks are gigantic. So this neoclassical reaction to the empirical result that we don't see firms obeying the hoteling rule is, don't worry, we'd be happy. Uh, firms are obeying the hoteling rule, so the theory's fine. Also, it means that the resource stocks are gigantic, so there's really nothing to worry about f in terms of imminent depletion of exhaustible resources. So again, don't, don't worry, be happy. So that's the neoclassical response. There is a non-neoclassical response, which is quite different. The non-neoclassical response says, are firms really obeying the hoteling rule? If the firm obeys the hoteling rule, in this graph in the upper left, it, it, at a time number two, it goes to, uh, at time number one, it goes to a point like, like I've drawn here, at time number two, a point like this, at time number three, a point like this. Think about what that means for profit. It means this at time number one, this profit at time number two, this profit at time number three, and in the profit versus time graph near the center of the screen, that means you're at a point like this at time number one, this at time number two, this at time number three, there's one, maybe there's two, maybe there's three. Now what happens if a firm decides to violate the hoteling rule and just act to maximize short-run profit? 
If it violates the hotel rule and just acts to maximize short run profit, then in the upper left hand graph it's here at 15 tons. And it stays here. Now it can't stay here forever, but it could stay there for a long time. In the original example I used, it could stay here for four periods. You know, maybe that's four decades or four centuries. And in each one, the profit that it earns is this much, and that's more profit than any of the profits that are earned in any of the dates in the hoteling rule. In other words, in the graph in the, in the center, let me make this a little bit larger, so the hoteling rule is the path that I've shown here, but if you violate the hoteling rule and just stick to short run profit, you get more profit at all these dates. Now, it is true that along the short run line, the red line, you're pulling out more resource than you are if you're following the hoteling rule because if you're following the telling rule, you're just pulling out this much, and then this much, and then this much, all of which is less than 15. And so if you go along the short run path, you're running out of resource more quickly. And what that means, if we extend the timeline, is that along the short run path, eventually you're going to crash. You run out. And then you go to zero, and you stay, stay at zero forever where if you obey the hoteling rule instead you turns out you keep on going maybe not forever but for a lot longer time and if you look at this whole picture then it turns out that the black line gives you a higher present present discounted value of profit than the red line does and so the black line which is the hoteling rule line I'll just call it an H there, label it with an H. The hoteling rule line, or HR for hoteling rule, the hoteling rule line is actually better. But it's also be uh, it's only better if you look at it in a really, really long-term perspective. In a short-term perspective, especially for uh, periods of time close to the present, the short run profit maximizer is here or here here or here. In other words, for many, many dates, here and here and here and here, this might many years, many decades, even many centuries, the red line seems to be the better line. And the argument of these non-neoclassical economists is that Wall Street functions on the basis of short-term results. And if you had one firm that was following the HR line, the, the hoteling rule line, and another firm that was following the red line, for year after year after year, the red line is higher than the hoteling rule line. At some point, the hoteling rule firm is going to be able to buy out the other firm. I, I mean, the, yeah, I'm sorry, I said it the reverse. The other firm, the, the, the firm, the firm here uh, doing short run profit maximization is going to buy out the hoteling rule firm. Uh, it's going to be easily be able to get the financing to do that because the hoteling rule firm seems to be an underperformer, and is uh, an underperformer for the first few decades or the first few centuries. Yes, it's not an underperformer overall. If you had a perfect crystal ball and could see the entire future, then you could see that the hoteling rule line is actually the better line to follow. But in the real world, people don't have those kind of crystal balls, and so the hoteling rule firm is going to get bought out, and managers that run companies according to the hotel rule are going to lose their jobs. And the only managers that are going to be left are managers that run firms according to the short run profit maximizing point here and and over here. What that implies is that firms are pulling out resource too quickly. In other words, they're stuck here for a oops, sorry for a long time, whereas they ought to be at points like this and this and this. So the quantity path that firms are actually taking the uh, along the along the red line uh, is pulling out resources too quickly. It's if we if we wanted to draw it, 
draw this on the on the quantity graph. The hoteling rule the hoteling rule quantity graph is this with points like one and two and three corresponding to one, one here and two here and three here. I'll erase those. And the uh, short run profit maximizing the the red line is stuck at 15, which is the higher quantity for a long period of time. Now again, it's going to crash. And the hotel and rule quantity is going to continue for a long time. But in the short run, the, the red path, the short run profit maximizing path, let me just say this. The, the, the red path here, we call it short run profit maximizing. It's the short run profit maximizing path because you see it maximizes short run profit right there. So this red path is pulling quantity out too quickly. It, it ought to, the socially optimal path is the hotel rule path and this red path is pulling out quantity too quickly. So, the non-neoclassicals respond with this argument to the observation that empirically firms don't obey the hoteling rule. And their conclusion from this graph and here is that firms pull out quantity too quickly. So, it's in some sense the opposite of saying don't worry be happy. The non-neoclassicals take the empirical result that firms don't obey the hoteling rule and say well then what firms are actually doing is they're maximizing short-run profit not long-run profit, not the present discounted value profit and therefore they're pulling out quantity too quickly and therefore we should be worried that they're pulling out quantity too quickly. So this is why economic theory is important. You can have exactly the same empirical finding that firms don't obey the hoteling rule. And depending on your theoretical framework, you can react to that in two completely opposite ways. If you have a totally neoclassical framework, you react to that by saying, oh, that means that there's a huge amount of natural resources. And that's the reason why we can't detect firms obeying the hoteling rule. And if you have a non-neoclassical perspective, you'd say, that that the empirical result that firms are not obeying the obeying the hoteling rule is true. They're not obeying the hoteling rule, and that means that they're pulling out resources too quickly, and therefore we should be worried. So two opposite policy conclusions coming from exactly the same empirical observation because of two different theoretical frameworks. By the way, the red path, which I've called the short run profit maximizing path, from a neoclassical perspective, the red path is a dumb path because it's not the whole telling rule path. And I'll leave it up to you whether, particularly looking at this graph of profit versus time, whether you think that in the real world it's true that the red path is the dumb path and, and, uh, uh, and that the telling rule path is the smarter of these two paths. We are almost finished with chapter 16. W only one other quick thing to discuss. The hoteling rule that marginal profit rises at the rate of interest is true in simple cases. How, um, and one of its implications is that if you, have, if you have two worlds, one has a low rate of interest and one has a high rate of interest, that, the, um, that in the world with a high rate of interest, marginal profit is rising more rapidly and it turns out, I, I'm not going to show that, but it turns out that means that quantity is being extracted more quickly. However, if you have a slightly more complicated world in which in order to get enough money to buy the equipment to extract the resource, you need to borrow money, then the interest rate plays two roles rather than one. It plays the role that I've indicated here, but it also plays another role as being the cost of borrowing money. 
in that kind of situation, a high interest rate uh, has two effects. It has the effect illustrated in the hoteling rule that makes you want to pull the resource out more quickly. But it also makes it more expensive to borrow money, and therefore you're going to borrow less money, and so you have less equipment, and so you're going to extract the resource more slowly. This is sometimes called the conservationist dilemma. I wrote a paper on this quite a while ago. And what it means is that if the interest rate doesn't play this, this simple role of just being essentially uh, a cost of time preference, but also is the price of borrowing money, then things get more complicated than this simple hoteling rule story and it's harder to, to draw conclusions.